On October 13th, Starship, the most powerful rocket ever built by humanity, completed its fifth test flight in what was its most impressive and successful flight so far, with both stages landing successfully as planned. This colossal rocket developed by SpaceX aims to make humanity a multi-planetary species with the capability to explore and potentially inhabit other planets and moons within the solar system. With an empty weight of about 817,000 pounds and approximately 11 million pounds when fully fueled, the vehicle stands 397 feet tall and 29 feet in diameter. It is composed of two separable, fully reusable stages, with the first stage, called Super Heavy, housing 33 Raptor engines that lift the vehicle to an altitude of about 43 miles. The second stage, above it, named Starship, can carry up to 330,693 pounds of cargo and, in the near future, will land on Mars and other planets, transporting up to 100 people. To get an idea of the power of this insane rocket, during liftoff, the 33 engines of the Super Heavy generate a combined thrust of 17,100,000 pounds force. This not only surpasses the Saturn V, which produced 7,874,000 pounds force, but is also equivalent to the same power as 73 Boeing 777 at maximum thrust. Assuming the rocket is 397 feet tall and the exhaust plume from the Raptor engines was approximately one and a half times the size of the rocket, one can conclude that the exhaust plume was around 594 feet long, 594 feet of pure fire. But the most impressive part of Starship's fifth test flight was, undoubtedly, the landing attempt, attempting the impossible and unthinkable, landing the Super Heavy, or the rocket's first stage, back on the launch complex at Starbase from where it was launched. But how exactly was this landing possible? There was a risk of the rocket missing the target and colliding with the tower, a massive explosion, and what if the engines did not ignite upon return? What would happen? Well, to start, the Super Heavy features a design that does not include landing legs, just like its older brother, the Falcon 9. This was done to reduce the booster's total weight, allowing it to carry more payload to space. For perspective, each of the four landing legs of the Falcon 9, made of composite materials, weighs 1,100 pounds, so the four legs alone add up to approximately 4,400 pounds. That said, let's look at the four fundamental systems that made this landing possible and successful. The first is the thrust vectoring system of the three central Raptor engines on the Super Heavy. The base of the Super Heavy is made up of 33 Raptor engines divided into three rings, of which the engines in these two outer rings plus the center are used for the landing phase, namely with the ignition of both rings for the initial deceleration maneuver, and later, only the inner ring remains, containing the three Raptors for the final landing phase. The second fundamental system for the Super Heavy landing is the Reaction Control System, or RCS, composed of small, strategically positioned thrusters around the vehicle's exterior, which release controlled bursts of compressed nitrogen to maneuver the booster in different axes, notably rotation, yaw, and pitch. Alongside these are the grid fins, an aerodynamic component that functions by altering the airflow passing through it, consequently maneuvering the booster, working in conjunction with the RCS. After the Starship separation phase, they allow fine, precise adjustments and correction maneuvers until landing. These grid fins, four on the Super Heavy, are made of titanium, each weighing around 2,200 pounds with an approximate length of 16 feet. The third fundamental system is the autonomous flight software. SpaceX uses an advanced autonomous flight control system that continuously adjusts the Super Heavy's trajectory based on real-time data ensuring that the booster stays on course. The software processes data from various onboard sensors, such as accelerometers, inclinometers, gyroscopes, GPS receivers, among dozens of others, and then sends instructions to the RCS, the grid fins, and to the engine's thrust vectoring system for precise control. The fourth and final fundamental system is the Orbital Launch and Integration Tower, or OLIT, located at Starbase which has arms that actually catch the booster. This mechanism is called Mechazilla. 
This tower not only serves to catch the rocket in mid-air, but also serves as a means to integrate the two stages, stacking them one on top of the other for flights or when testing the vehicles. The tower stands just over 400 feet tall. Now that we understand some of the critical systems that made the Super Heavy's landing possible, let's look at the rocket's return flight profile. Remember that only the events occurring after the stage separation are relevant, meaning the events from 2 minutes and 30 seconds of flight onward. At 2 minutes and 32 seconds of flight, the grid fins move into a specific angle, followed by the shutdown of 30 engines in the two outer rings. This phase, known as hot staging, is when the second stage engines ignite before separation occurs. This allows for enough relative velocity for the two stages to separate, and the movement of the grid fins allows the gases from the engines above passing through them to help push the rocket to the side. The next phase is one of the most important known as the boost back burn. It essentially cancels the rocket's horizontal velocity. To understand it better, if we could see Starship's trajectory from another angle, this would be the path taken up to the moment of stage separation, meaning that beyond rising vertically at a certain point, the rocket began tilting toward the horizon. This means that in addition to the rocket having vertical velocity, or upward, it also has some lateral displacement. However, to return the rocket to Starbase from where it was launched, two things are necessary. First, the rocket must perform a 180-degree turn, pointing in the opposite direction. Second, it needs to ignite its engines to cancel its horizontal velocity, preventing it from following a complete ballistic trajectory and falling into the sea, instead returning to Starbase. Hence, this maneuver is called boost backburn or return burn. It starts around 2 minutes and 45 seconds and ends around 3 minutes and 40 seconds, totaling about 55 seconds. Around the same time, you can hear in the transmission that the tower is ready to receive the booster. We did hear that the tower is go for catch, so that was one of the big criteria we were looking for. Indicating that several systems were verified and it can receive the booster. This may seem like simple information, but it's actually quite complex and critical. During the three-minute flight of Starship, thousands of criteria needed to be met, ensuring that systems on both the vehicle and the tower were in excellent health and functioning correctly so that the mission director could manually command the Super Heavy to head toward the tower at Starbase. If any issue had been detected in either the Super Heavy or the tower hardware, the director would not have issued the manual command and the Super Heavy would follow its standard trajectory, falling and landing in the Gulf of Mexico. If no problem was detected, as none was, the director would send a manual command for the Super Heavy to execute the boost backburn maneuver targeting the tower as the landing site. After completing the boost backburn, the booster, with assistance from the Reaction Control System, RCS, executes another 180-degree rotation, positioning itself correctly for re-entry. Now descending at a supersonic speed of over 2,480 miles per hour in controlled free fall, an important safety configuration comes into play. The booster descends at an angle rather than perfectly upright. This is done to allow the booster's body to generate some lift, helping guide it to the landing site. This maneuver also helps reduce the booster's terminal descent speed since the angle creates a bit of drag, preventing excessive acceleration. Throughout this descent phase, the grid fins, which are electrically actuated, make small adjustments to keep the rocket on the correct path, a trajectory that aims to land some distance away from the tower. This off-target descent profile is intentional and is a safety measure. SpaceX does this to ensure that if the Super Heavy engines fail to ignite, the rocket will continue on its path and impact a location safely distant from the tower, minimizing any risk to the structure. This type of contingency planning is evident from past Falcon 9 flights, where similar off-target descent paths allowed rockets to safely splash down in the ocean, avoiding the landing pad. In the final moments of descent, around 6 minutes and 30 seconds into the flight, 13 Raptor engines reignite to decelerate the booster from supersonic to subsonic speeds. Then, 10 engines shut down leaving only three to handle the precise landing maneuver, guiding the rocket towards the tower. The mechanism arms of Mechazilla close in at the exact moment to catch the booster. The video footage shows that this correction maneuver, which shifts the rocket's trajectory from an off-target descent to a precise landing on the tower, is substantial. 
Notably, two landing pads on the Super Heavy make contact with the Mechazilla arms. These two points provide all the support needed for the booster to be safely held in place. Just before landing, the deluge system, which releases large quantities of water onto the launch platform to dampen heat and noise from the Raptor engines, activates, likely as part of SpaceX's strategy, to reduce potential damage to the platform. It was a unique, majestic, and successful landing on the first attempt, something that is likely to become routine in future launches, with continuous improvements to the technique. However, much of the technical work behind this successful landing remains unknown to the public. For instance, there is the concept of a suicide burn. To understand this better, it's essential to know how rocket engines' power variation operates. Unlike other types of engines, rocket engines have an ideal operating zone, and below this threshold, they simply shut down. This range falls around 40% of maximum power or lower meaning that the thrust can vary between 100% and 40%, but below that they turn off entirely. This means that the ignition of the three engines during the final descent phase must be precisely timed, neither too early nor too late from the optimal point. Following the initial deceleration, ten engines are shut down as they were only needed for rapid braking, leaving three engines to handle the final landing phase and make any necessary course corrections per the rocket's design criteria. These remaining three engines continuously adjust their thrust to ensure the rocket lands on the platform at the lowest possible speed and with maximum smoothness. However, unlike the Falcon 9, it appears that the Super Heavy booster doesn't use a suicide burn. Instead, it seems capable of hovering, similar to Blue Origin's New Shepard. While this still requires precise engine power control and has its limitations, it is not as critical as a suicide burn since hovering provides more time to correct possible errors during touchdown, or in the case of Super Heavy, the catch. Another point worth analyzing is after the boost backburn, using a satellite image from Ryan Hansen Space Renders showing the tower in the upper left and a green zone, the estimated target area where the Super Heavy aimed during its descent. This probable impact zone, located in a practically deserted area, is distant enough to ensure that any debris from a potential explosion would not affect critical nearby infrastructure. If everything went as planned, the engines would ignite and the rocket would steer toward the tower. Another aspect to consider is the sequence of the rocket's capture by the Mechazilla mechanism. It's essential to remember that Mechazilla is an autonomous capture system designed to catch, lift, and lower rockets. The mechanism's arms can automatically adjust their position, timing, and force to precisely grab the rocket, responding in real time to any minor misalignments. As the Super Heavy approached the tower, precise data on its position, speed, and probable landing point were transmitted by telemetry to the Mission Control Center. This information allowed Mechazilla to adjust its arms for better interception and capture, especially if the rocket was slightly off the ideal capture point. In one video, the left arm is shown moving first, followed by the right, closing in and catching the rocket. The capture process was complex, so several other details are worth noting. For instance, the mechanism arms could only close after roughly half of the rocket had passed by them. Additionally, since the arms were designed to make contact with the rocket, they were padded with a type of sponge to prevent damage, and the rocket was built with a designated contact area to absorb these intentional touches without significant damage. This system is an impressive and meticulously engineered design. Another critical aspect of this landing's success was the rocket's orientation. Like airplanes, rockets also have three defined axes, vertical, lateral, and longitudinal. Maintaining the correct orientation along the rocket's vertical axis, or roll axis, was extremely important for a successful landing. This is because the landing pads needed to make contact with the platform within a narrow margin of error. If the rocket rotated outside this small margin of a few degrees, the contact points might miss their targets, potentially leading to the rocket landing on its grid fins, which could pose a problem. This landing required a level of precision and complexity unmatched by anything previously achieved in the aerospace industry. Remarkably, SpaceX accomplished this on the first try, with everything going according to plan. 
There were thousands of potential failure points and things that could have gone wrong during the landing and capture by the Mechazilla mechanism. The Super Heavy could have descended with too high a vertical velocity, preventing the arms from closing in time. It could have had too high a horizontal velocity, colliding with the tower. The Mechazilla arms might have closed too early, before the booster arrived, among many other catastrophic scenarios. This successful landing highlights the complexity and difficulty of rocketry and the incredible talent of the people who designed and work at SpaceX.